The first scramble for Africa was when European colonial powers saw a continent that was vast, rich in minerals and land, and very poorly defended. And they rushed in to carve it up and steal the land. The second was during the Cold War, when East and West were locked in a struggle for global domination. That's when the Soviet Union backed Marxist despots all over Africa, and the Americans backed any leader who said that he was in favor of capitalism. The third wave, which is happening right now, is much more benign. It's much more about voluntary exchange, about trade, and about the spread of technology. It's a new kind of scramble for Africa, which, if handled well, Africans can win. The old stereotype of foreigners in Africa is that they're only interested in the minerals and not Africa's people. That's still sometimes true, and there are still a lot of corrupt mineral deals going on in Africa, but much more important now is African people. There'll be more Africans in the world than Chinese people by 2025. It's a huge market, and since they're all living in independent countries, they're in a much better position than in the past to negotiate better deals with the outside world. And this has been great for Africans, greater openness to trade and investment from the outside world is one of the reasons why Africans are two-fifths richer than they were in 2000. Of course, the fact that there are fewer wars and better macroeconomic policies has also helped. There's still a big problem with corruption. Unaccountable leaders in the less transparent African countries can often sign deals with outsiders that benefit them personally, but perhaps not their country so much. The things that Russia's doing in the Central African Republic, where you have private firms protecting diamond mines and the president of that war-torn country, are to many people reminiscent of what happened in the 19th century at the height of imperialism. The scale of foreign interest is unprecedented. Between 2010 and 2016, 320 new embassies were opened in Africa, probably the largest embassy building boom anywhere, ever. Turkey alone opened 26. Last year, India announced it was going to open 18. Military links are spreading too. China alone has ties with 45 African countries. America and France are helping defeat terrorists in the Sahel. Oil-rich Arab nations are setting up military bases in the Gulf. And Russia has military deals with 19 African countries. African voters and watchdogs need to insist on more transparency in the way that these deals are done. The kind of work that Kenyan journalists have done to expose scandals connected to a Chinese railway project is very encouraging. Second, African leaders need to think more strategically. China is one country, Africa's 54. It's going to be much harder for them to drive the right kind of bargains if they let China negotiate with them individually behind closed doors. Even if African unity is a bit of a far-off dream at the moment. At least you could see more regional unity, which would be very useful in negotiating infrastructure projects. Finally, Africans should take what some of their new friends tell them with a pinch of salt. The Chinese government is very keen to tell Africans that democracy is a Western idea and that development needs a firm hand. This may be music to the ears of some of the strongmen on the continent, but African voters should not be fooled by it. There's a lot of research out there suggesting that the African countries that are more democratic tend to grow faster and prosper better. As the population gets more educated and moves into the cities more, we're seeing that they're more critical of governments and giving the ruling party a lower share of the vote. As African politics grows more competitive, voters will have more clout and they'll be able to insist on a form of globalization that works for Africans and foreigners alike. <laughs>